Welcome to The Film Analysis, today with Jackie Brown by Quentin Tarantino. Jackie Brown was released in 1997. Tarantino's most beautiful film as Tarantino slows down the usual frenzy in his films and allows the camera and the characters quite some space and time. Jackie Brown celebrates cinema and television in equal measure and an icon of political cinema, Pam Greer, playing the title role. Jackie Brown is a quite a restrained film, much quieter than other Tarantino films. Evidently, Tarantino shot the decisive money transfer from three perspectives. Here, the brakes are once again applied. Here, we are not only supposed to follow the plot, but to open ourselves completely to this aesthetic. These three perspectives also let us become observers again. We take on this role in the cinema anyway, but it's laid out again once more. We are supposed to look not only once or twice, but three times. Jackie Brown also represents Tarantino's most radical film. Even if we barely hear the shot, it hits the mark. Jackie Brown, after all, is the smartest contribution to the debate on the current question of identity politics and the question what is cultural appropriation and is cultural appropriation allowed to exist at all. We have had a lot of debates in the arts these days. They address, for example, Scarlett Johansson being asked to play a transgender person and withdrawing from it. Because she is not a transgender person, is she allowed to play the role? White directors have been accused of cultural appropriation because they take on black themes or black aesthetics. Is the author of a work, black, white, straight or gay, male or female, these are the burning questions now. And it's no longer about what the work says, although it should be essential. In political debates too, there is always the objection that only the person concerned is allowed to express itself. Men should not discuss abortion because they are not affected. Now, many laws are made by people who are not affected, but that does not necessarily mean that the laws do not apply. Only those affected or victims are then allowed to speak very absurd. By this logic, one would have to say a white, heterosexual, privileged director created Jackie Brown, who presumes to focus on a black, underprivileged woman. Consequently, Tarantino also engages in cultural appropriation. He uses black exploitation cinema, soul music, and much more. It's true, that's exactly how Tarantino operates, but it's not unfortunate, rather enriching, to understand why we must look at film history. For the black exploitation film already engages in cultural appropriation by adopting the genre rules of the detective and vigilante film, but places a black main character at the center and engages in politicization by drawing on the black movements that were everywhere at the time, transferring this rebellious character to the screen. The films featuring Pam Greer from the 70s continue this cultural appropriation and recoding. Now it is no longer a black avenger who is male, but with Pam Greer, female. In the great film Coffee by white director Jack Hill, Greer fights a powerful drug cartel, which of course symbolizes white patriarchal domination. It is an attack on the existing order because this cartel cooperates with the police, is supported by the police. Moreover, in the film Greer has a relationship with a black lawyer aspiring to a career in politics, but also supposedly interested in social black people's issues. But 
It will later turn out to be mere lip service. Greer then recognizes the enemy in him, but he wants to explain the whole thing. He says, but I am also black and we somehow share a common identity. Pam Greer rejects this identity-based explanation and shoots him. A year later, Jekyll directs Foxy Brown with Greer again. Of course, the title is reminiscent of Jackie Brown. Here, Greer fights against a drug and white slavery organization. It's also right and patriarchal, but it's run by a woman. As in Coffee, Greer is initially driven by personal revenge, but soon she will join forces with black revolutionary groups to fight injustice. Both films are not only stellar moments of black exploitation cinema, but they also show that it doesn't matter who stands up for universally valid emancipatory values. What matters is whether one does or not. Greer only shows solidarity with the women who support the struggle and only with the black people on her side. So what does Tarantino create? It's not only through Greer that he cites the exploitation era. He uses the sounds of the time like the Delphonics and his story picks up certain motifs from back then. Jackie Brown is already a product of cultural appropriation because the film is based on a novel, but here too Tarantino carries out a recording. Originally, a man is at the center, but Tarantino puts a woman in his place. Jackie is a stewardess, her successful years long behind her. She smuggles money across the border for the black gun runner Odell, played by Samuel L. Jackson. The fact that Jackie's glory days are over, the two white policemen also discuss this at length with her, refers to Greer's film career, which was unsuccessful even after the 1970s. Jackie Brown plays with Pam Greer's self-stylization, with which she wrote film history. In the final showdown, we see Pam Greer sitting at a desk and she keeps pulling out the gun. She's practicing her pose, which we know from her old films. The police follow Jackie's trail. To save herself from a long prison sentence, the police now want her to trick Odell. She is supposed to smuggle half a million dollars so that the police finally have a reason to arrest Odell. The police and the criminals no longer work together. But still, Jackie is neither on the side of the state nor on the criminal side. She is in between. And that's where she meets the white corruption agent Max Cherry. They fall in love, as usual as emancipatory values are, so is love. And as we shall see, so is art. Tarantino weaves a dance tapestry of film historical and media references through the music, through the actors, through the aforementioned and other films of the 70s, in which Odell's girlfriend watches television all day. For example, old Italian films, Beast with a Gun, featuring Helmut Berger, and by Max Cherry going to the cinema again and again. This cinema, however, is situated in a shopping mall, the place where the money is spent and the central location of the film. This film is not set on the street like the earlier films, but entirely in the world of consumption. Here you can buy your identity if you can afford it. And Jackie is also part of this consumer world as the money transfer also concerns a new trouser suit she desperately wants to buy. Just as goods move in almost incomprehensible ways, so too does Odell's money. And this money, of course, stands for globally migrating capital. But perhaps it stands for something else. There is, after all, this bag of money 
Jackie manipulates by taking money out and putting entertainment novels instead to fill up the bag. You could say that as fluid as the capital is, so is the style, so is the fiction. That's just how Tarantino works. Tarantino brings back the spirit of exploitation cinema with Jackie Brown, but he must realize that times have changed. The political has given way to consumerism and the accompanying individualization. While Pam Greer was still able to ally herself with political movements and revolutions in her earlier films, she now stands all alone. Only the unity as a couple, this unity she forms with Max Cherry, saves her from complete isolation. But the end, as we know, is a very lonely one. Jackie Brown features a proud, brave, smart woman. As with Jekyll, she again uses her seductive skills tactically, but a sadness shapes the film. A revolution or the political is nowhere in sight. A shopping mall offers a thousand possibilities, only lacking the possibility of questioning the system itself. Jackie's revenge must remain a private one. For the time being only art remains, Tarantino wants to tell us not without nostalgia. The freedom of art must be defended. Without cultural appropriation there is no art. Art is per se anti-identitarian or anti-cultural. It cuts the cultural roots trying to locate something in a nation, in ethnicity or a gender identity. Art plays with cultural idiosyncrasies and differences, yes, but it removes them from their traditional context. This does not mean that everything is made equal. Rather, it is put at the free artistic disposal. Sampling, remixing and recording is the essence of Tarantino's films, but also the essence of artistic creation in general. Pianist Claudio Arau was said to be the most German pianist ever. No one interpreted the works of Beethoven and others as more German, but he was a Chilean. In the same way, of course, a white director may create real exploitation films. Art is universalistic. Therein lies the political power of art and the power of a film like Jackie Brown. This universalism can be traced back to the Apostle Paul, among others. In his letter to the Romans, St. Paul writes something very clairvoyant, still valid today. He says in Rome 2, 12, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Paul refers to the law of God and continues further in Rome 25. Circumcision has value if you observe the law. But if you break the law, you have become as though you had not been circumcised. So then, if those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, will they not be regarded as though they were circumcised? Paul, plays, Paul says that identity does not matter, but confession does. 
This even applies today. Paul would have to intervene in a contemporary debate about art. He would say it does not matter whether the director of a film is black or white, homosexual or heterosexual, a man or a woman. Philosopher Alain Badiou addresses the issue in his great work St. Paul, the Foundation of Universalism and writes, Paul's outrageous gesture is to withdraw truth from any communitarian grasp, be it a nation, a city, an empire, a territory or a social class. But according to Badiou, we are caught up in identity debates. And he writes, through this intersection between culturalist ideology and the concept of man as victim, any access to the universal is destroyed. What is the unifying real that underlies this valorization of the cultural virtue of oppressed subsets that underlies this linguistic praise of communitarian particular particularisms which ultimately always refer to race, nation, religion or gender alongside language. It is quite obviously the monetary abstraction whose false universality is perfectly compatible with communitarian variegation. The long experience of communist dictatorships should be credited with having shown that financial globalization, the unrestricted rule of the empty universality of capital, had only one real enemy, another universal project, even if it was abortive and bloody." End of quote. But he reveals capitalism very much tends to these individual identities, constantly opens new markets for them and offers new products. And only an all-encompassing universal force can oppose this false universalism. In Jackie Brown, this very universal counter-project against capitalism, which relies on identities, is only art but at least the spirit of universalism is preserved. If we only look at the particular, we failed to see the greater scheme of things. However, in Jackie Brown, we not only watch, but see. It would be nice if you would like to support the film analysis financially. You can do so via my bank account or PayPal. Also, you can find me on Patreon. Thank you very much.